So we are here now with, with uh, Samu Hammond, the Miss Cannon Center, and he has been uh, in, in Finton, and this Finton that has uh, um, a very interesting um, day in libertarianism. Kind of have to, to think about libertarianism, and how how do you do you came to to this point of, of, of libertarianism? Because it's it's quite different than the other things that, uh, and what in general people think in libertarianism. Um, I guess I wouldn't. I, I guess I just disagree with the premise. I don't think uh, our approach is very different. I think that in some ways American libertarianism is the exception. American libertarianism is very different from any other political ideology that you find in the world, especially in its modern version. And obviously, since it's been, since it's like been, been around, it's, it's spread, but um, countries all over the world have liberal traditions, traditions of, of liberalism, rule of law, free markets, democracy. Uh, those things all predate American style libertarianism. Um, so I think actually we're, we're a bit of a throwback. We're just doing uh, traditional liberalism as it's, as it's been understood for, for centuries and across different countries. Yeah, that, that, that is an interesting take because I mean, I, 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 that's, that's something that I can relate. I mean, uh, as, as being someone that, that lives in Latin America, I mean, here, it's very strange that the libertarian quote broad or, or even Mises. They, it's very strange that people quote Mises for some. And and I mean it's it's quite interesting because in, in some ways uh, I think that the the, the the debate about libertarianism has has become uh, very sectarian. I, for example, one of the, of the people that I I admire and. and and I always have a lot of respect. Is 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 Carl Hess, who was an anarchist libertarian, the the, the speech writer for for Goldwater, which then become more of a, of a left libertarian. But but for example, when I think in left libertarians, left libertarians talk too much about anarchy, but they don't really. For example, in a practical example, if I were in the United States. Uh, I will try to, to dialogue with, with the people on, on the left. Actually, for example, in the Green Party, there are some people with some libertarian ideas. For example, the, the guy in the Green Party in New York, I, I, I covered this for, for an outlet here in Peru about some, some racism in American politics back in some years ago. So, uh, and. And when it was covering him, it was quite strange because the, he was, for example, there was a guy that was from the new left. He opposed uh, Kiss on Excel pipeline on, on, on more or less the return grounds, or property grounds. And he was a very interesting guy. And I, there are a lot of, of people on the left uh, that, that, that that are interested in Georgism in, in other kinds of stuff, and, and, and they probably not necessarily are purely anarchists, but they they are not necessarily as anti-libertarian as, as some people on the right just think that all the left is like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, American libertarians sort of erupted in, in a fury when when uh, Toma Piketty suggested a wealth tax, right? Um, and he was getting that, like, uh, the Georgists, uh, what their proposal is for land value tax is basically a wealth tax. Um, and there's been a long tradition of libertarian thinkers, left libertarians, just straight up libertarians who differentiate between sort of the products of your labor and the products of productive uh, capitalism versus rents, right? Um, and there's this idea that if you create an artificial scarcity in land, then you're, you profit in a way that uh, isn't productive. It's just purely extractive. And therefore, there's just, you're just in taxing that. 
um, because it should belong to the common or something like that. Um, those ideas aren't very, those are like very old ideas. Uh, and I think there's actually quite a bit in classical liberalism that comes from that distinction between productive, uh, like pr productive production and extractive production um, and drawing a moral distinction be between those two. And, you know, to the extent that liberalism values ca competition, for example, and rule of law, it's to preclude forms of rent seeking. Um, but, you know, my, I don't really identify as a left libertarian. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the United States context, we call ourselves uh, libertarian sometimes, the combination of liberal and libertarian, uh, just because we're, we're basically liberals, like in the sense that um, all Anglo-American countries have liberal parties. Uh, we would like to see just more liberalism uh, taking place in the U.S. that is not sort of um, the far-left progressivism or the kind of social neoconservatism. Uh, that is just a more, it's more centrist, I think. And the, the weird thing is, is that we get pegged as left libertarian because the U.S. has pulled so far to the right that, um, you know, if you, if you are a libertarian and you talk about, you know, maybe uh, the size of government measured as a fraction of GDP isn't the most important metric, that is a very, all of a sudden makes, makes you left wing, right? Because the, the Overton window has been pulled so far to the right. So I don't really think of myself as being left libertarian because I'm not an anarchist. I'm not a... Uh, I, uh, I don't even think of myself as a radical. I think in, in some ways liberalism is the antithesis of radicalism. Um, yeah, yeah, so, I, but it just, it just happens in the context of the U.S. We, we are called vaguely left libertarian, but, you know, in, in Canada where I'm from, uh, I'm, I would be very far to the right, you know, and in, in, <laughs> in the U.K. we would be on the right uh, pretty much everywhere else. Germany would be on the right, but only in the U.S. Uh, we end up sort of falling on the spectrum on like sort of the right of center Democrats, right, which is still left of center of, of the country as a whole. Yeah, I, I mean it's it's quite it's quite different in every country. The as you have said, it has a, a very particular liberal tradition, and for example, the, the liberal tradition in Peru used to be. Um, much more um, open to 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 certain kind of uh, of government actions, but, but lately, like like the libertarians have been focusing most in economics and, and very basically every issue, like like they don't care. For example, today there was a march for legalization of, of marijuana, and there uh, there were a lot of kids because. Uh, a lot of here, a lot of the movement is not necessarily for uh, young people or college students, which is kind of what happened in other countries, but for people that, that have illness that they treat with, with medical marijuana, but actually it's illegal. And and, mm -hmm. and the police uh, tear water cannons, they, they beat the people even if there were kids in the protests. It was kind of sad. And, yeah. And sadly, many times uh, libertarians don't, 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 don't say anything about this. And, and I think that that has made, and not only in Peru, basically in Latin America, that's why, I mean, libertarians have a, a bad reputation here. I, I guess that that, that I, I am more of a less libertarian in some sense, but, but since I have been influenced in some way for, uh, by, even some, um, how to put it this way? I mean, I, I'm more of a pragmatist in certain issues. I, I, for example, I, I, uh, I support issues like like single payer healthcare. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is really a great problem, with, or or with, or for example, with the universal basic income. I think that there are elements of, of the welfare state that. that that as long as the state exists, who, who 
will function in some way. But I, I mean, I, I, the, the, the issue that, that, that your article some weeks ago about the, the issue with, with, with Pepsi was very interesting because uh, I don't think it has been pointed out many times, but, but a lot of times corporations in some way has been almost neoliberal social justice warriors in, 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 to use your terms because I mean it's 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 quite curious here in, in Peru there I, the, the, I had to do some the, some paperwork in, in a bank and and had to to do, put an account and or something yeah. it was with the bank two or three weeks ago and here in Peru uh, it's illegal uh, gay marriage and and there are not even civil unions like like in other countries but for example the bank has a a banner a very big banner inside a bank that says we do not discriminate in accounts you can open an account with 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 uh with a, a person no matter the gender no matter yeah, yeah. anything and and it, it's quite something that you don't see in, in many places uh, here in Peru and, and in more parts of Latin America. Yeah, I don't know the case of that bank, but you know, sometimes that stuff happens um, by virtue of franchise law, like, or franchise rules. Because um, like when a McDonald's opens in a developing country, uh, often they have the cleanest bathrooms. Because McDonald's, as the multinational corporation, has has standards for how clean the bathroom has to be, um, and so you're if you're in India and you see a McDonald's, it might be the best place to use the bathroom, right? And so in the same way that um, multinational corporations are like import, import or export Western standards, they also export Western social and cultural standards, right? So. Um, that's why I think, in terms of globalization, multinational corporations are are a good or uh, are, are an underrated uh, vehicle for exporting sort of progressive or liberal uh, norms to other other countries that have never had those uh, had exposure to them, right? Um, but in general, like you know, I, I'm not. I don't really have a and I think it's also a mistake to have a very well-defined philosophy, like a very well-defined like thing you are, like anarcho blank. You know, I don't, I don't. Uh, I think there's that it's sort of a kind of obsession, and it was very much a historical part of like Marxism, Marxism and stuff like that. Like, are you a Trotskyist or, or you know, are you a Leninist or a Marxist-Leninist? And like, there's just this obsess obsession of nomenclature and obsession with uh, identity and labels. Um, and it's all kind of pointless because you're not going to ever, you know, you know, just get to reconstruct society along your lines. Uh, so I think it's much more, much more useful to sort of instead define yourself by kind of like a word cloud, you know, like a, <laughs> a, a set of sort of ideas and values and, um, and this is actually goes part and parcel of pluralism. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pluralist, but like, even within my own value set, I think you have to be kind of pluralist within yourself, um, because uh, you know there's there's always going to be trade offs. And um, you know, if you ever heard the expression, or you know, people say stuff like, if even one child dies because of this regulation, then that's too many, or something like that. Um, economists will often point out that this is sort of a bad way to think about the problem because uh, there are trade-offs involved and anytime you have sort of a rule that says no matter what or like even if like one person loses their life that's one too many lives you know it sounds very you know high high and mighty uh, but obviously there's an optimal number of accidents there's an optimal number of uh, optimal amount of pollution, optimal amount of everything, because if you try to eliminate the last accident or the last car accident, the last uh, bit of carbon being emitted, whatever, you're going to run into like these very steep costs. Just you know, it's just this diminishing returns, and I feel I feel there's diminishing returns to 
to ideological concepts as well. So um, the more you get to the limit of an idea and push on that one concept, like maybe utilitarian ideas and util utilitarian values, you get closer to the limit and all of a sudden the costs of holding onto those ideas become uh, exorbitant. So I think there's like, I don't know, like a convex combination of different different values that uh, is probably, you know, where truth lies. And um, it's a bit of a pathology when people uh, obsess about purity of their own values and uh, and it leads them into sort of fantasy role playing <laughs> where they're like trying to design a, a world based on one or two axioms or precepts. Uh, when in matter of fact, the real world, the closer you approach the pure axiom, the, the you're 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 making massive trade-offs against other values that might matter. Yes, I mean it's 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 really a, an interesting reflection. I I was thinking about and, and I was comment you about this in, in Twitter the, the the of the Pepsi ad that was very significant and had a very strong backlash and. And it was very, very interesting because I think even some some conservatives have, have noticed that about, about the boycott. That, that, that come, for example, Rod Rare, I think he's a very thoughtful conservative, and he for a long time has okay. been arguing that that. Huh? Uh, which conservative? Rod Dreher. Oh yeah, yeah. American, An American conservative. Yes, yes. Oh. He was pointed out that the. the Corporations are not necessarily the, the more the best friends of of, of, of conservatives, and, and actually he he makes a fair point because he was saying that 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 especially from a Cold War point view that there were other issues that, that make it that, that corporations like at, at least some corporations like Republicans more than, than yeah than, than than Democrats, but but. On, on the on the issues, for example, a lot of the, the more global corporations rather than, than I don't know, for example, companies that, 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 that of, of mineral resources or, or oil or companies or, or whatever, um, the the other kind of, of, of corporations like, for example, uh, the most cosmopolitan, to, to say in some some term, uh, kind of corporations have generally a, a liberal leaning in, in some ways, and, and have explored that kind of liberal leaning to 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 the war in some some sense, and and I think that the, that this element is a lot of times uh, misunderstood because. Um, I mean, the issue is that sometimes here, uh, some more, uh, they are criticized, uh, and and it's quite complex because when when there was an attempt to to push for a gay marriage law, some some companies expressed their their support, and the, and and then conservatives attack as as if gay marriage was an imperialist cause. And, Mm -hmm. And it was kind of strange because they, they conservatives don't say nothing about the the fact that the the the, the U.S. have some some troops here yeah. in some military bases, but 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 when it comes to to gay marriage, it was supposedly a, an imperialist policy. Yeah, and I mean this this is the problem with neo-Marxist critiques of liberalism and neoliberalism is, um, in some sense when a multinational corporation or foreign influences even media like the people in peru download western television shows and watch them right you know they're getting a kind of external thing being imported that is influencing them and um and sometimes i feel like all neo-marxism is is uh taking very banal things like someone watching a Western television show that portrays a gay couple and then attaching the label imperialism on it, right? It's, it's really like, you just call it an import. <laughs> there's imports and exports, there's cultural imports and cultural exports. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, analysis, Marxist analysis is just uh, taking very mundane facts or, 
and, and attaching loaded language to it. Um, Cause I wouldn't deny like in some framework, yes, it is imperialists that, you know, there's this external Western influence that is uh, propagating gay marriage, but it's not like that. That's just a, that's just a semantic. You're just calling it imperialist. It's, it, it is what it is. And it's a good thing because um, people deserve respect and dignity no matter where they are. And, um, you know, it's much, it's a, it's a much lower cost way of facilitating progress to do it through culture and media than it is through force. Yeah, because I, I mean, there are certain different degrees of, of globalization and, and we are now in the, in the year of the 40th anniversary of, of, of both Star Wars and, 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 and punk and both are, are examples of, of two paths of globalization. I, I mean, Star Wars is, is the mainstream film that open basically everywhere. But punk also have a influence in, in places, in unlike places, even in Cuba, as far as I know, there was, uh, at, at least at, at some point, there, there was a relatively large punk scene, although <laughs> it had problems with the government because despite the Cuban government has sometimes uh, supported musicians and artists in other ways, um, since they, the large part of, of, of punks were, were anarchists, they basically put the, the cops to, to, to try to persecute them. Yeah. It was yeah. kind of ugly. But, but it was another kind of globalization. Here in, in the 80s, the punk scene was really large. And, and there was some bands that were not exactly punk, but, but were to the scene, the underground bands and, and mm -hmm. what have you. And it, it's the noble over war. I mean, it's in, in places like unlikely as Indonesia, the Middle East, the, even in Africa. It's, it, Punk scene is, is, is a global scene, and I was thinking the, the other day uh, the, the, in an interview we watched about uh, a singer, which was a pop singer, Mo, which has done a, a, a track with Major Lazer, which was a very huge hit some time ago. He, she she told that, that she was she's Danish, so she lived in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. she, he, she was telling the story that, that she a lot of the influence that she had was to go to uh, to a empty house that was occupied by anarcho punks who, who invited bands to play there and and it's part of global culture. I mean, the, yeah, that song yeah. was a, a dance hit in here in Peru. It sounds a lot and and but I mean it has a very particular kind of style, but. But that is how globalization works. I mean, in, at some point, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. kind of globalization, of, of more underground globalization, cross path with the more mainstream globalization. Yeah, totally. And I think that yeah. actually, um, you know, there's examples you know, of rock bands and uh, like heavy band. metal bands metal that band. play underground in Iran underground. and stuff like that. Stuff like that. Uh, uh, and I really think that. Uh, I really think that. Uh, uh, feedback, by the way. Feedback. You might want to turn your your volume down. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a way in which, uh, you know, a lot of the reaction to the Pepsi ad and um, within arts and culture more generally to to capitalism, like there's a very sort of anti-capitalist bias, or at least you have to like talk like you're anti-capitalist, except for maybe rap music. Rap music seems to embrace capitalism. Um, or at least some part of it, because there are so many capitalist rappers. There are, there are, totally. But I mean, like, uh, US hip hop, like, I think in part because they're a marginalized community, they felt like, um, you know, the, their community celebrated when they were able to buy bling or whatever, or like have sports cars, you know? Um, anyway, I, I think that, uh, I think the irony in this or the hypocrisy, I don't know what the right word is, is that, 
culture and like new music, underground music, that's like some of the most capitalistic activities you can do. Um, it is like, it is being a kind of cultural entrepreneur to adopt new music and to innovate on music and to um, try to disrupt mainstream music. You know, this is, and I, I, I feel like what people complain about commercial culture that what they're complaining about is actually sort of like mainstream culture. Um, but main, something is only mainstream because it became popular. And uh, I feel like uh, the essence of capitalism is to be sort of dissatisfied with, with popularity and dissatisfied with the incumbent. You know, you're trying to disrupt the existing firm and um, people who get dissatisfied with mainstream culture end up being the innovators because they're the ones who defect and uh, and produce competition to the mainstream culture. This is pumpkin. <laughs> um, and you know the opposite of that is like Mao's China. Everyone wore the same uniform, right? And I feel like there's a that, that like that like Mao, you know, horrible horrible person, but like he his version of communism. What that's like what left leftism should be, like. If you are really anti-capitalist, you should try to squash difference. Like, like socialism is a form of conformity, and uh, the opposite, capitalism is a form of nonconformity, or at least it rewards nonconformity. It, re it rewards sort of being a contrarian. If, if uh, like, if you're a contrarian in the stock market, and you end up being right, you that you are the richest person in the world, right? Um, and I think that, so I think the mistake the fallacy people make is they, they think of capitalism in terms of the incumbent, the mainstream culture, and instead of thinking of it in the totality, where capitalism includes, commercial culture includes both the, the mainstream music and the fringe music that's competing to become mainstream. And you see this time and time again where like, you know, punk is underground and then it sort of breaks into the mainstream and all of a sudden there's like it's playing on the radio there's like spin-off bands that like like green green day that combine pop, pop elements with punk and then people start hating it right because all of a sudden it, it's become popular and now it's you need to disrupt that um and so i think that's like that's very bourgeois and that that's a good thing and I think all I'm doing in that Pepsi article is being very self-conscious about it and, and sort of making the case that we should just embrace it. Like, you know, if you, if you care, if you are a true, I think, liberal or neoliberal or whatever, uh, you have to, you should embrace commercialization of culture. Um, because, A, if you've gotten to this point, you don't actually think there's anything about uh, buying and selling that that taints the virtue of something, right? You know, I th this goes back to what Deirdre McClowski talks about in the Industrial Revolution and and sort of the way that merchant classes were perceived. It was very like dishonorable to be a merchant, and I feel like it's still there's still residue of that in how we think about culture. Like you're supposed to be producing music for its own sake, and if you try to if you're doing it self-consciously for money, um, that is like inauthentic or something like that. Uh, whereas I, whereas I think a, a true, a full embrace of commercial culture and, and capitalism should include an embrace of commercial culture and and commercialism more generally. Like some of the, I, I think some of the most amazing music and artwork and film has come f in the form of advertisements. And uh, and uh, I don't think they're inherently. I don't think something that is is done for, you know, by a starving artist is inherently more virtuous.
Yeah, I, I remember uh, an advertising here that, that won very several awards. It was uh, an, uh, of a newspaper that had ads and, 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 and it was an ad about an example of, of an ad that they put in the paper and that, that ad was about an Elvis and there was a room with thousands of Elvis and it was very funny yeah. and it has a lot of success. I mean, there are really interesting things in advertising and and I mean, it's it's, it's really interesting and I, I don't know what's your take on, uh, on the issue of, of public finance of the arts because here in Latin America, this seems like a, a big issue, a lot of Mm -hmm. Times filmmakers are, are, are especially filmmakers, are, are, are trying to, to put a lot of pressure on governments to, to give more funds to, to films. And I don't know if, if that necessarily should be the, the dynamic because, I mean, there are good movies in Latin America, but some of the good movies in Latin America had been, hadn't been financed by, by the state. It's just, mm -hmm someone driving a camera, even if it's a bad camera, but, but, but shooting something that, that is quite interesting. Yeah, it's interesting to bring that up because I think a lot of, uh, I think I get my views in part from being Canadian and in Canada culturally lives in the shadow of America. Um, America is such a huge, and it's probably this way for a lot of countries. America's culture is so dominant and um, you know, so, so it proliferates so widely, uh, and it's so cutting edge that uh, Canada population thirty million um, has a hard time competing, right? And and there's constant fears and anxiety that our culture will become like quote unquote Americanized um, because it will be overwhelmed by the the deluge of. American content. Um, I, th I think there's so, and so for that reason, Canada has like a very long history of subsidizing the arts uh, through sort of an, uh, analogous to the NEA and PBS. We have a, C, a, a CBC is a Canadian broadcasting company. We have content requirements that radio have to play. Um, a certain a certain percentage of music has to come from Canadian record labels and stuff like that. Uh, I don't really have a strong opinion about that. I think there's it just it it, it just resisting it when I was younger, resisting that, and uh, is sort of what influenced where my views are now because I I I just didn't understand why we were doing it, and I didn't see anything inherently wrong with. Americanization and homogenization, if, because it's, it wasn't homogenizing; it was just, it was just meritocracy. It was just people's music people liked. Um, on the other hand, I still see, uh, sort, and this just goes back to like what I was saying earlier about having different values, and sometimes their intention, and I'm trading off of different values. Like, I'm not just going to be like a hundred percent one thing, because I I do see the I do see the rationale for a smaller country like Canada to want to preserve a national identity and to promote things that are uniquely Canadian, um, because that that's it's not it's not a benign thing. It it affects our institutions. It affects our common culture, and um, it also can be important for sort of upward mobility, like. Uh, if you if you want to if you're a Canadian band and you want to become you maybe you are a really good band and better than any American band uh, but if you're drowning in American content then our native industry will not develop enough to provide you a ladder uh, to, to be competitive so this goes this is a kind of protectionist argument for um, protecting the national the, the domestic uh, cultural commons. Um, and I, I don't really have a, a strong argument for or against it. I just, I, 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 I think, know I think libertarians discount it and I think that um, the nationalists overrate it and the truth is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> yeah, it, it's probably there. I mean, for example, um, I mean, 
the the issue here is also that that, that a lot of the films are are American and some people are protesting that but, but the problem is that, that I think it's a selection of a lot of films because sometimes the films that 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 that, that are not selected sometimes the 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 films that are selected that are not from from United States are most are house films and and that it will that it will be very hard for people to, to watch it because mm -hmm. uh, I mean there are there are films from from a lot of countries that, that are very digital uh, yeah but I think it's valuable that France has its own film culture right and I, yes, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to put a price on that and I don't know really how to and I'm not I don't have any confidence that like the free market and culture will produce the optimal because I think their culture has a strong network effects and everyone wants to be listening and watching the same TV shows and watching the same movies um, and you know it on some margin I think diversity across countries might be worth protecting, especially when you factor in, you know, the pol politics and, and stuff like that. So, I, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. For example, you were talking about Canada. Like, for example, Canada used to, uh, even, and not, not, not only Canada, but the, the Quebec office here used to back uh, in the film festival, the, the fact that they bring, some films and they translate the films and from Quebec so because yeah. they are in French usually here the, the only films that they translate are the ones that are in English so yeah I, I know that there there is particularly a, an effort in, in the Quebec film scene that, which is kind of weird because on the other hand it's, it's very strange to, to watch uh, in Latin America a Canadian film in English so uh, in and that could make some some confusion because a lot of of of, of Latin Americans are are in Quebec and 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 it's quite strange because a lot of, of Canada speaks English uh, mm -hmm. and, and has films in English but, but but for some reason in Latin America we are more accustomed to to the Quebec culture in some way which quite quite could be quite odd. Weird. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um, no, I think Quebec's a really good case study because Quebec has a very strong uh, focus on culture, and uh, and that's partly because there's also this anxiety, just like Canada as a whole is an anxiety about being absorbed into America. Quebec has an anxiety about being absorbed into Canada, and um, I feel that. You know, a lot of this cultural stuff ends up being the most important thing to think about when you think about economics and capitalism. It's the thing everyone comes back to because people, like, that's the substance that people experience within any economic system. It are the cultural artifacts around them and the identities that 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 they serve to form. Um, and so, you know, in the same way that, like, you know, I feel like a lot of the cultural war stuff in the U.S. right now comes from groups like Rod, Rod Dreher is a good example. His, his thesis is that Christian, Christianity is becoming absorbed into modern culture. So like he wants to basically separate and have Christians exile themselves uh, and in a monastic way to like live at good Christian lives and to build barriers and walls around the influence of modern culture because modern culture is very homogenizing. Um, and that's where I see Rod Dreher and a lot of leftists as being kind of in common because they're both afraid of this homogenizing effects of markets. Uh, and they're, they're both, they're both kind of like, they're both conservative in a sense because a Rod Dreher style conservative wants like, you know, Christian conservatives in general, Orthodox, you know, they want to suppress nonconformity, suppress con subversion, just like, uh, just like I, I mentioned earlier, that a leftist government, ought, like if they're being consistent, ought to be trying to suppress subversion, counter-revolutionary forces and stuff like that, because 
those things are bourgeois, they're capitalistic. And as soon as you let some of it in, it kicks off this entrepreneurial discovery process that, it, that is the fuel of the market and the fuel of homogenization. Um, so I think those, I think that that's just a way to think about, like, it, to really understand, like, the anxieties people have and, and the anxieties that cultures have. It's not unique to, like, you know, Christians feeling they're being absorbed into secular culture or Quebec feeling it's being absorbed into Canada or Canada be feeling it's going to be absorbed into America or Latin America feeling like it's being absorbed into the West or, you know, th this is just pervasive and it's, and I think this is one of the underrated problems of globalization is it causes, globalization is amazing and I, I it's, it's like, this amazing, awesome force, but it creates, it's creating anxiety around the world because yeah. it's, you know, like there, there are languages that are dying because people get absorbed into the lingua franca and they don't speak their, their, their native language or on the small island or whatever. And, uh, you know, I feel like for everyone who is w witnessing this, anyone from an older generation, must have incredible anxiety that they're going to lose their culture. Uh, and I think that's why partly why we're seeing a backlash and why the backlash is global. Uh, it's, um, you know, the French Marie Le Pen is in some way saying, I've, we're not being absorbed into Europe, right? And, uh, but I'm a globalist, I'm a, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a liberal, and I think that, uh, there needs to be someone out there making the case that being absorbed is not a bad thing. <laughs> you know, you have, have been following Icelandic politics, but, but I, some time ago I read an article about it, and, and it's very funny because the, the leader of the Pirate Party writes more in English than, than, in, than in Icelandic, and it's quite funny because it probably it's the only country where, where a politician talks more in, in a foreign language than in the language of its own, but but I mean, as far as I know, some people say that even Icelandic is going to die, and and, and Iceland doesn't have a a massive uh, uh, right wing like, population. Yeah, they're like a few hundred thousand, right? They're like three hundred or four hundred thousand. Yeah, I mean, just about that. The the, the issue is that 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 since then, it's very hard. For, for software companies to, to translate uh, the uh, software for, for, for all of people. Yeah. So people in, in computers, that they use computers, they, they need to, to know English. So basically all the populations, at least the, the most young ones, they have to... to yeah, and you're hitting, only, on, you're hitting on kind of the underlying forces. The underlying forces are this network effect. You know, there's huge efficiencies to everyone speaking the same language. There's huge efficiencies to everyone adopting broadly similar norms, just like it's sufficient for us all to drive on the one side of the road, right? And the, the more, the, 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 the bigger the, the institutional set, the, like when we move from countries to trading blocks and from trading blocks to like federations and stuff like that, you know, there's going to be Inevitable, like there, this is sort of the the arrow of history. This is what gives it the the arrow towards uh, homogenization and and sort of bigger supranational institutions is this efficiency, this underlying like force based on like what what things cost and you know how we can do things cheaper and. Uh, and those, all those things are, all those economic forces are blind to culture. And so culture move, just is, moves much slower than the efficiency. So it's way, it's way cheaper for people in Iceland to learn how to code or learn how to read English because they're going to be doing that work in English, right? Because that's just network effects. And the economics doesn't really care about your culture. Um, and, you know, my, my vision is that there's just, there's just an optimal rate where we, to this, and maybe we're, maybe we've been moving too quickly, uh, and maybe it, that's causing, that's like, 
ex amplifying the anxiety uh, because uh, cultures change with every funeral, right? And you know, if if there's you know, the longer we're living, we're living to eighty now. You're going to have people who are stuck in one culture because once you become acculturated, uh, you're kind of, you don't really change. And so there's this like massive lag between how fast economies can globalize and how fast cultures can globalize without making it without a resistance. Yeah, I, I mean, for sometimes people think that globalization is just one thing and that it's just the United States, but it's it's all over the world. I mean, the the issue is that, that for example, here in Peru, there are a lot of, for example, I think Peru is the country with more K-pop clubs and a lot of K-pop has been very massive here. I don't know why. K-pop? K-pop, <laughs> yeah. It's, Korean pop? Yes, Korean pop. And it's quite strange because here it's there is not a large Korean community. There are very few Koreans, and there are a lot of Chinese and, and Japanese yeah. for, for a lot of reasons that, that, to be honest, I don't completely understand. Well, that's understand. the same thing in in America. There's a huge, you know, Japanophile community that loves Japan and and loves, and you know, it doesn't seem to be correlated with Japanese immigrants. It's just. So somehow we randomly became obsessed with Japan. Yeah, but uh, and there was it could be a reflection about about the, the issue of, of, of freedom because China doesn't have a very strong soft power. The, when when some people think about Chinese cinema, they think in Hong Kong, but Hong mm -hmm. Kong has certain autonomy. So so China has a lot of problems. In its soft power, in his, yeah, that's a really good point. It's it's for example, Turkish novels had a a, a great success in, in Peru in the last years, and and Korean novels also sub mm -hmm. and and they have a, a great success here, and, and and it's they have beat the Venezuela and sub the Colombian sub because they have been different, and, and people wanted something different, and. And it's quite strange. Uh, yeah. um, I think maybe it's because China, like the the leaders in China, when when they want to do something, when they want like to build microprocessors, they they design a zone, and they write the rules and they set the taxes that are ideal for microprocessors, and then they pour billions of dollars for microprocessors. And then all the microprocessing facilities go there, right? So that's like their development model, and I don't think they have. I don't think that works for culture. You know, I don't think, like, I don't think you can just pour subsidies into a special economic zone, and uh, to make a cultural hub. Uh, I think it's just inherently spontaneous, um, and this goes back to the authenticity thing, because the more there's outside forces that have an, have an ulterior motive or are trying to, you know, astroturf culture, uh, the more people are suspicious of it. Um, and so maybe this is like part of China's weakness is um, even though they've embraced capitalism, they haven't truly embraced spontaneity. Yes, I, I mean, I, I understand more or less what you are saying, and that's why Hong Kong is has this this appreciation from the West. I mean, it's um, especially Ch Hong Kong cinema has has quite success. The, the last film that was Asian film that opened in a more or less in a in a normal cinema was a, was a film from Hong Kong actually. Was the last Asian film in, that opened in, here in Peru in a, in a cinema? Um, Chinese films only have come for for film festivals and things like that, but, but not. Uh, but then there's like, uh, uh, what's his name? Wei Wei. Uh, Wong Kar Wai. Hmm. Wong Kar Wai, which is a. Uh, um, popular 
filmmaker. Ai Wei, um, the, the artist. Yeah, Wei Wei. Ai Wei Wei. Uh, yeah, Ai Wei Wei. Yeah, but he lives overseas. So yeah, I know. I mean, this is this is part of why, like, that's a symptom that he has to live overseas because. Like his, I think his art is a really good example of what I mean. Like he's a, he's a, he's a penal, he's like the ultimate capitalist because um, his art, and this is true of art everywhere. Like real art is subversive, and that makes it very bourgeois. That makes it very capitalist. It's nonconformist, and so he gives the middle finger to the government, and uh, that that doesn't that's not allowed in China. And so maybe that that's that that lack of subversion or that lack of like ability to be subversive and question the government and stuff like that is very stifling, probably. Yeah, yeah, I, I suppose that the, I mean, China is still a mystery. There are not much things that, that we still know and has a lot of restrictions. And stuff. Yeah, and it's quite astonishing that, that, that China is always pointed as as example that, that, that especially uh, from from the kind of uh, Socialism, Marxism, the, the, say neoliberalism, a lot of the sample that the, the, the capitalism could, could live with with, with with oppression. But I think that the point is that, that if China wouldn't have embraced any kind of reform, it would be closer to North Korea, probably. I mean, it has certainly some some difference. I mean, both religiously and, and culturally, but that it will be a more closed country, probably. North Korea is the, an example of taking the logic of wanting to protect your identity and culture at all, right? Like at all costs, right? Yeah, but, they, but that that goes to the point about uh, about Bernie Sanders, for example, when when he opposed open borders. I, I mean, I'm not necessarily a purist about open borders because, well, I in general think that it's the 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 libertarian point, I, I mean, I get why as a politician he wasn't quite supportive, but, but I think he could have made a, a more um, a more fair point about in the context that there that Trump was scapegoating immigrants and he's saying that that, 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 that open borders was just a corporate idea and that, that doesn't seem fair to me. No, it's not. I mean, that was just the weirdest thing. No, like when he said that, everyone I know, people who work at coke-related places and stuff like that, they did double takes. Like they were like, "What?" <laughs> and you know, it's it. It, it was kind of weird. Um, yeah, the difference between the Koch brothers and Bernie Sanders is the Koch brothers have a universalistic cosmopolitan morality where Bernie Sanders has a parochial nationalistic morality and he he and this probably goes back to his union days where he cares about the in-group um, and so when he talks about the working class and poverty he is specifically talking about Americans and that's why he and Trump have a lot in common whereas like People like Macron, uh, Macron in, in France, you know, these sort of, or, or Angela Merkel. I think they they have more in common with the Koch brothers, <laughs> in some way, because <laughs> they have they have a a, a internationalist view, and um, and I think that's probably like the correct view is it, there's just political constraints. Yeah, but how do you think it it, it, it become like that? Because I mean, the brothers have the bit mark for for all liberals, but I think Jordan Arthur Bloom put put a very interesting article that, that said that the Cato Institute is actually much more anti-war than than basically any liberal think tank. The Cato is uh, why well, I think that's because um, the Cato Institute, like, there's nothing inherently anti-war about liberalism far from it. I, th I think that liberalism properly understood w is like biased in favor of free trade and and peaceful commerce and like a, 
a market-based approach to peace instead of war. However, the Cato Institute and American libertarianism has a old old uh, roots within the old right, the American old right, which you know was skeptical of World War Two, you know, and um, so I think that's and that's that was seen in Ron Paul. Uh, that like there's there's a much stronger anti-war connection, an anti-empire building connection. Um, but yeah, I don't think that. And I have a colleague, Matt Fay, who who uh, who does foreign policy and defense, and he's writing a huge paper on rethinking libertarian foreign policy. And uh, I don't I don't want to speak for him, but I think just to summarize his view, it's that the Cato Institute and um, libertarian foreign policy, quote unquote, has basically been realist. It's a foreign policy of restraint, and they've allied with realists uh, because the philosophy of protecting your national interest um, means it also means ignoring humanitarian crises overseas, and you, it gives you the right to ignore things like things where you could intervene and potentially do some good, right? And so the Cato Institute in that sense, even though the Cato Institute is, is basically for open borders, they're also on the foreign policy side much less globalist and cosmopolitan because they, they align with a, a realist community that, that is focused on America's national interest. Hey, that's an interesting take. I haven't thinking about it. I mean, for example, Daniel Arison, which worked at the American Conservative, probably doesn't have many differences with, with the people of, of the Cato, even no, probably in economics. Uh, American conservative is all realists. They're like that. Like they're a realist man. Yeah, I think Gottfried was kind of more hawkish. I think he was a friend of, of Nixon, but but even him was not a neo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, you're right. They're generally realists. This is a large part. And it's interesting because I, I think that, the, that there is not a, a very uh, a very important reflection that there sh should have been in, in the departments of international relations or political science about, about international relations theory. Because, I mean, it's certainly that libertarianism has many differences. In, in, in different types of, of views and, and and it has like certain how, how, how to put it a, a unique outlook in many many ways but but it's true that libertarianism foreign policy has been mostly realist and and, and well to, to a point that, I mean some people in the Rumpel crowd even sound quite pacifist I mean yeah. yeah. To a certain point, they, they are really much more uh, uh, anti-war than, than the people even in Cato, uh, and it's 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 really a, an interesting reflection. I, I think that sadly in Latin America, there there haven't been a lot of talk about about uh, libertarian foreign policy because the the people that have been mostly libertarians have been economists, not not political scientists. So yeah. Mostly, the reflection has been about about you know economical mm -hmm. issues, fiscal issues. So, so, I to be honest, I don't know what's the view of many of the libertarians about about foreign policy. Yeah. I will say that that, that that some of the people that I know of of the local chapter of Students for Liberty, there are some that are more. Like like the people of the Cato Institute or, or even of the Mises Institute, that are much more anti-war. There are some that are more moderate, but to to a fair degree, uh, the older libertarians and the my generation, I, I I almost do not know anything about their foreign policy views. Yeah. yeah, Jacob Levy has a series of posts he's writing for Learn Liberty on uh, on the deficit of political science among libertarians, and and sort of. The, the fact that so many libertarians go through economics and not in philosophy and not through political science leaves some gaps in our in our thinking. 
uh, it's a really interesting series. My, my own view is that, um, I mean, I took, I took like one or two international relations courses in college. So I don't, I'm not by no means like this, is not my area of expertise. Uh, uh, but the, you know, you break down, first of all, I think international relations theory is just, it's just mostly bullshit. Um, like it's just, it's just kind of dumb how they break down the theories into like, Oh, you, you're a realist. You think the world is anarchy and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're these kind of ideal types that I think are just weird to think about in, in those terms. Um, but uh, if I recall, there there is a theory, a branch in IRR called the liberal institutionalism or something like that. And um, this is, I think, the closest to like a liberal theory of international relations. And it's based on, first of all, it takes a kind of more public choice or political economic view of institutions. It doesn't just see states as actors. It just, it, it breaks states down into, you know, uh, bureaucracy is where people have influence and or they don't have influence. Um, secondly, it, it, it's more focused on institutions that foster cooperative win-win kind of situations, uh, positive sum situations, and those could be trading relationships or they could also be international institutions like the United Nations or the G8 or the G20 or whatever. Um, and I think those, I think it's a theory that better matches the real world um, because it, it, because states don't actually act as atomistic things. Um, we act with, you know, both, like we have, we act on, because we have norms, you know, and and those norms are mean that we're not in anarchy where we, states feel constrained in what they do. Um, and that's partly fostered through these cooperative institutions in the same, in the exact same way that they are within a country. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't know if it's a fully cohesive theory, but it, what it does say is that if a liberal is more comfortable with the, like the, the UN or something like that, because you know, these are institutions for discourse and, and discuss, discussion and cooperation um, and for coordination and, and they solve coordination problems. Whereas there's a, going back to the libertarian root in the old right, there's libertarians like in the John, like Ron Paul, you know, history in the John Birch Society and stuff like that, where, you know, they're terrified that like, they're going to be, like the UN is going to take our sovereignty. Um, and we're going to get global government, right? Uh, that to me has nothing at all to do with liberalism. That is like how we start this conversation. That has to do with like a very weird idiosyncra idiosyncra idiosyncratic feature of American libertarianism that has no root in liberalism. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I, I don't know if you have listened about Karen Rose, which is a a former diplomat, uh, a former British diplomat that became an anarchist, but, but it's quite strange because he actually has become more of an entrepreneur of international relations. He has a, a company basically that, that, that put the UN in contact with non-state actors that, that because he said that, that now most of the problems in the war are not wars between the states, but wars in... Yeah, civil wars. Yes, and, 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 and he... He has become an entrepreneur of, of, of international relations, and he he contacted Rebel Group, uh, get a, a spokesman, and bring the spokesman to to New York, and they yeah. did a, a meeting, and that's 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 his his his, his venture. It's quite interesting. I mean, it's it's, it's certainly the, the non-state actor should should be put much more in focus and. And, and to be honest, uh, the libertarians that have been writing about foreign policy, despite the, 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 some of them, even the anarchist ones, uh, don't necessarily call much the the non-state actors. And the non-state actors have become sometimes more important than than, than actual states. No, oh, of course. And I mean, that should be obvious. Like it's weird that it 
this is the problem with IR theory is like it's so ivory tower that um, you know if you were just starting with no knowledge of international relations theory you would you would you wouldn't you would just stipulate that of course people outside the government have influence you know the dude who assassinated Franz Ferdinand you know or you know Osama bin Laden yeah no but but to to go to the point about globalization and immigration for example just Walker of reason just to, to write about Argentina so about their the issue that they for a lot of time had open borders and, and now they don't have it. So, uh, I mean... The world? Of, huh? America, you mean? Argentina. Oh, Argentina had open borders? I know that. Yeah, more or less. I mean, was basically like that. I mean, you you come to the country, you do the uh, some papers and, and, and you have residence for some time. And if you have residence for five years, if I'm not wrong, you can apply for a citizenship. So you can, mm -hmm. and then you can say the all your life if you want. That's not a big problem in Argentina. But uh, the the new government that actually some libertarians supported, Mauricio uh, uh, Macri, has changed that that laws, and now it's more difficult. Uh, um, get even a permit to, to work in Argentina, so so it's 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 they have been some people expelled, and and, and sometimes the, the problem has been that 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 that, that people um, have like these in in some parts of both Latin America and Europe the, the issue that that that, that conservatives were more libertarian quote unquote because they, they they talk about markets but this is going to affect a lot of industries uh, migrants especially from Bolivia from even from Peru that were in Argentina were uh, were able to, to work for lower wages than, than, than the Argentinian people that's why they, they come there and that's why employers prefer them so um, yeah especially in, in industries like like um, like the fashion industry so they will make uh, competitive uh, clothes clothes in a competitive price to, to our countries but, but if, if, if these policies are, are becoming implemented this this kind of factories are going to to either contract Argentinians which will have asked for a higher wages and, 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 and probably will not be that much competitive if in, in the global market so they will have to close their factories and, and it will be a very messy thing and, and, and I think that's probably one of the reasons that, that it's not been talked that basically the Argentinian government hasn't been much successful in spite of what some lower Chinese thought. What is uh, the crisis in Venezuela? Um, how is that influencing other Latin American countries and how they perceive sort of what works and what doesn't? I mean, it's, it's certainly a very complex issue. I, I have, I am writing, well, I, I finished write um, yesterday an article that, that I, I, it's still, it, Thing, maybe one or two things I'm going to do, but, but it's an article about Bolivia and, and actually well, in, in some way uh, there have been some quite strange of market reforms there. So, um, I mean, there, there are certain issues that are very complex, for example, uh, even in countries there are very particular regions. For example, in Bolivia, there is El Alto, which is a city that is very close to the capital of La Paz and has been described as the Hong Kong of, 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 of the Andean region because it's, a, it's basically a lawless place. Uh, the police generally don't come there and it's basically an open black market. But it's a, basically an open black market with one million people, which is not necessarily the, 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 the case for most black markets. So, uh, and, and in Latin America, there are quite large black markets, but no one is basically a city in itself. So, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's a very curious case because 
Um, it was the city that that that, that led the the rebellion against uh, against the former president, which Quiroga was certainly a, a more conservative kind of guy. But but they have protested against against uh, uh, Evo Morales also, and, and and it was described as a professor uh, as a Benjamin Cole was has been uh, the late Benjamin Cole was a professor of of urban studies at Temple as, as the most revolutionary city in Latin America and also as the most neoliberal. So it was kind of, of, a, of a very curious case. And, and not only El Alto, for example, Bolivia is a very strange example of how um, the left has some kind of good relationship with, with some companies. I mean, not all the companies, but some. And it has uh, some kind of uh, good um, uh, economic grades, even from from organizations that that, that were criticized by mm. by Morales, like EMF or, or the World Bank. But but I mean, it depends on, on, on different countries. I think that obviously Venezuela is is the example of, 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 of for right wingers to, to attack. Uh, I mean. The problem with, with with the right in Latin America is that, that they somehow use Venezuela to to, to, to try to criminalize gay people and, uh, yeah. and I don't, don't know what's the, the relationship. I mean, the Bolivarian Revolution wasn't necessarily much liberal. I mean, they were quite reactionary and gay rights and, and women rights actually. But but I don't know. I mean, it's it's quite strange. I mean the the the. the if someone thinks that the, 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 that the American right is homophobic, the, the, the Latin American right is far more homophobic <laughs> than, 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 than the... Yeah, so it's... No, it's of course, of course. American, American, American culture has, has... Just in the last 20 years... Last 20, uh, yeah. Really embraced alternative lifestyles in a way that never... Like, in the way that I think we're blind in America and Western Europe to you know, how permissive our culture is because we're, we're so, um, we're so within the culture that it's hard, like, it's, it's hard to even think in the 1990s that, like, Democrats were, talk, were talking as if legal, legal gay marriage was, like, a step too far, right? Like, we'll do civil unions, but legal gay marriage, we're not going to touch that. Um, and now, like, it, you, you get called basically a homophobe if you hold a position that was mainstream 20 years ago and uh so it's like you know it's, instead of stepping back 20 years ago step into a different country that in some sense is on the line of on the historical line of progress like 50 years ago <laughs> yeah you know there's uh, and, uh, so yeah. I, don't, I don't know i i think that maybe it's not super surprising because we're again like we're the weird ones. America is the weird one. Yeah, I mean, back to Venezuela. I, I mean, it's being used by by the right by saying no, this is what it happens. But but but, but the, other, the other example is Paraguay. I mean, Paraguay has been governed for almost forty years by a right wing dictator, and it's the most poor country in South America. So. I mean, it's not that the right is somehow going to make good economic choices. I mean, promoting sometimes a very reactionary new. Uh, I, I mean, it's not new, even neoliberalism, but it's a very reactionary economic nationalism. It's much more closer to to Richard Spencer dreams than than the nationalism <laughs> Britain. But I, I don't know. It's it's quite complex the situation. I mean, uh, in Paraguay, they, they try to literally burn the. The, the Congress, so, so it it was quite a rebellion there, and uh, but I, I fear that, that there are many experts in Paraguay. And to be honest, I am not one of them. So it, it's it's quite complex to 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 know what's going to happen in Venezuela because this is another point where where more or less a lot of people don't know what it's going to happen. But what I think will happen is that that. That what the protests are, are are reaching for is 
is that the, 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 there will be a coup d'etat and, and they will call for elections like, like happened in Egypt or something like that. But, but that's the only clue that, that I could have. Mm -hmm. As far as, as, as the Latin American left, it has been different. I mean, for example, in, in Chile, they are very critical of, of, of Maduro, but in, in Bolivia, they are very supportive of him. So it, it, it depends on the country. And, and, and some countries are more positive, some countries are more negative. Mm -hmm. Left Let me ask you a question. Um, yeah. During the Cold War, the U.S. did much more in terms of promoting uh, Western ref reformers in different countries and uh, doing some, like more active defense of liberal values. Um, whether that was like, you know, if a regime change happened, to try to get our person in there and to do market reforms uh, or just like uh you know sort of like radio for europe and that, that sort of thing like broadcasting intentional like there was a lot more active stuff going on and i don't know i don't really pay i haven't really paid attention to this but it just feels like the us is doing much less of that and um being much more laissez-faire and whereas you look at what russia is doing and Russia has propaganda networks. They have Sputnik. They have RT, and they are, um, you know, giving their side of the story, their narrative on things. They they have uh, pro-Russian candidates in multiple different countries. Uh, they have, you know, a strategy, an active strategy for how to intervene in elections and try to sway elections. And uh, you know, they fund groups that um like environmental groups and stuff like that 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 subvert a lot of you know they create civil unrest uh, and they're just doing things that are much more active in promoting the putin view of the world and it seems like they're having more success because they're the only ones doing this and in the cold war era the u.s was doing it and there were the Soviets were doing it too, and at least they they canceled each other out. But now the U.S. is because we're like a decadent country, and we're not really not really trying to spread our values, and actually, in some ways, are ashamed of our values. Uh, we're we're not doing it as much as we used to. Does that ring I true mean, to you? I mean, I mean it's, it's it's a very interesting question. I mean. The, the Soviet Union did some things that could sound very crazy. For example, in theory, have been the process, but as far as I know, there, there was a, in Argentina a case where they supported a Trotsky's guerrilla because they, they think they could overthrow the government. But they actually were like like criminals. They, they rob a bank, but, but they weren't like like a real have yeah. like a massive. No, so, that, that happens in like Eastern Europe too. Like America supports, you know, gov uh, government, and I, I don't know, I, like in Hungary or something like that. And like a lot of the time, they're they're far right or they're just mobsters. <laughs> <laughs> they're not, really, but at least they're trying. And at least they're like. I mean, there, every there so was, often you get every so often you get the right person. The the other day the some the. Last year, I mean, it was the, the, the chairman of the CIA or the FBI that said that, that, that he had voted for the Communist Party in one election. So it was very weird. It, it, it's, it's really a, an experience. Uh, back to Latin America. Um, I mean, I remember it was born in 1990, so I don't remember much about the 80s. But, but I, what I have heard. <laughs> But, but what I have heard about the AD is basically that, 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 that there was more or less uh, an organized left. And one of the great fears was that if they will have won the election, actually the United States was going to give them a coup. A coup yeah. like that, like, like with Pinochet. So a lot of, of that were the reasons why the, the left divided itself in, in, in two fractions. And, and, and it was very curious because in theory, the, 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 
the, the division was between the, the social democrats and, and socialists and, and, and but I, actually the, the two candidates of the two fronts were more or less social democrats so, so it was quite strange because in both coalitions there were radicals but, but it wasn't a real clear why they divided so it was very strange but it was a lot of have to do with, with the few confidence that the, they had in, 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 in that the victory will be respected by, by the US. So then, I mean, in theory, the most pro-US candidate was Vargas Llosa, who was more or less a, a, liberal, a classic liberal in, in the most sort of term, and, and Fujimori was a very technocratic kind of candidate. It was a very strange candidate. It's very complex to, to define himself and, and, and to define what what he was, I mean, he he had certain conservative developments, but but, but he's a very strange kind of character. It's very so. I mean, there there was there isn't it a big presence of, of United States in, in the way that that, that 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 Russia has, but Russia doesn't have a, a great presence in Latin America for different reasons. RT is is an air in in Latin America. Uh, I don't know why, but, but um, generally the, the the companies that, that carry uh, cable or, or mm -hmm. tel tel television are, are large companies. So so I don't know why they they actually there is no Russian channel here. So basically you don't know anything about Russia unless it's CNN or or BBC or or yeah. or in there. So maybe that's one reason why United States is not so active because uh, other countries are not necessarily much active here. Um, China is active with the governments, but not necessarily with the general population. Um, it's India is trying to be more active lately. It has been doing more. Uh, actions of, of trying to to connect with with, uh, with uh, the general public is doing some festivals and, and things like that and, mm -hmm. and, and and I have seen that they are more interested Turkey is also interested in Latin America they have make some kind of economic deals and and the Turkish novels uh, South Korea for example the the, the issue with the Korean soap operas is that as I have heard that, so I'm not completely sure, but what I have heard is that the government actually gives them completely free the, without charging anything for, for the sub operas. So the government gives... Like no the, royalty. Yes, so the government gives to, to, to other countries the, the, the sub opera. They, I, I suppose they buy the rights for the sub opera and they put it... Um, and I mean, I know that, that, that Japan has a, a, a very unique policy here in Latin America because they do a lot of cooperation, economic cooperation. So there, they have a, a good relationship with, 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 especially with Peru. And I think it has a very to do that that the Peru has the Chinese population is relatively large. So, so I, I think that they had a lot of fears that the. That, that in case of a conflict or something like that, like 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 Peru or other countries of Latin America are going to to, to look toward China, but but actually Japan gives much more of economic help to to Latin America than than, than, than China, despite being a much more smaller country. Yeah, but China's doing a ton in in Africa and uh, uh, Asia. Yeah, I think that it has to do also with the anti-communism that that, it's, that was part of of Latin American culture for, for a long time. I mean, with with the with the Bolivarian Revolution, with with, with Chavez, like these things change a little bit, but not completely. I mean, uh, I mean, Iran also with with the Bolivarian countries in some way. You know, the countries that go left in, in the 90s and in late 90s and early 2000s. I mean, Iran also like made a relatively good relationship. So Iran is a very complex country because Iran 
their government is quite conservative, but their population, their actual population is is probably much more liberal than, than any country in the Middle East. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's so a bit it's, like Turkey. It's a bit like Turkey in that. Yeah, Turkey. Big, big rural urban. If, I mean, it's it's quite an interesting case. You mentioned Turkey, for example. Should the military have even done something? The the U.S. military in that that coup. I mean, certainly uh, both in, in the national security and both in uh, um, the the Turkish government was going to be a a, a huge obstacle for for the Kurdish that are fighting ISIS so yeah uh, if they will have supported the ones that were giving the coup uh, and I don't know if, if, if Obama should have ordered a, a press issue or something that recognized the rebel government or something <laughs> but but all but probably Erdogan would have had a hard time to, to come back yeah this is getting way, way out of, of my depths <laughs> <laughs> It's quite funny because, as far as Germany refused to where the one to toward the West is because they <laughs> they more or less didn't care if they give him a good attack. And I guess they still, if, if someone tries to give him a good attack, the the West is not going to care much. But, but uh, I guess, I mean, Latin America is still an open place for 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 many. I mean, Brazil had also a very geopolitical game some time ago. Now they are in a very deep crisis. But 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 it's true that that America, despite the, the didn't have it from this government. Their uh, American culture is is very strong in the, the region. Music, uh, cinema, um, literature, or not so much, but but, but increasingly is is changing, especially with young young adult novels. Mm -hmm. It's quite changing. Again, the church had had certain strength because there were some kind of large American publishers. So, so, um, so they will try to, to push back to, to the issue that 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 all the translate literature, but but no, it's it's more harder for them. So I think that the American culture has a lot of immigrants. Mm -hmm. The American immigrants in, 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 in the U.S. and their relationship with, between the Latin American immigrants and their families here. And so, so I guess that their relationship also helps the United States in some way. Um, there are some Peruvians in China, there are some Peruvians in, in Japan, generally people of both Chinese and Japanese origin, but they don't have the same kind of relationship with, with their families back that in the U.S., in, in both in the, the, in the number of people and in the... Yeah. In the it's more of a diaspora. Yes, it's quite interesting. I, I mean, it's. I mean, certainly Canada is also a destination from from Latin America, and probably because of of, of Trump's policies on immigration, is going to increase and to be a, a destination for Latin Americans, and and it's it's quite interesting because uh, especially Quebec, I think, has a lot of Peruvians because uh, especially professionals. Uh, a lot of biochemistries, I don't know why, but, but a lot of biochemistries are, yeah. Peruvian biochemistries are there, engineers, people, basically uh, people on hard science or, or engineer. Have the point there. system. <laughs> yeah, the point system should, should be the, the probably. Also, we Nordic. Have a lot of, I'm, from East, I'm from Atlantic Canada and, and Nova, Nova Scotia, and we have a lot of Caribbean immigrants because we're like the first port. If you can't get into the, into the U.S., for the for the next port. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, New Zealand has some has open a, um, a consulate here, so so they they also uh, are trying to, to reach out to some professionals. And actually, for exchange, that it sounds Chile has a very strong 
uh, entrepreneurship, like um, uh, digital entrepreneurs. So, so they probably are going to try to attract at least the people with, with digital entrepreneurship projects. Mm -hmm. and, and and I mean, everyone is trying to, to catch the people that, that are not going to, to go to America, but we're thinking in going overseas. So, so it's quite a, I mean, Peru doesn't have a problem like that, so a program like that. They they tried to replicate some some scientists, but they, it didn't work. It's yeah. very complex to, to do that kind of programs. Um, Chile has much more infrastructure in, in doing things like that. Uh, Chile is, is is a good example, I think that that. that I mean, it's it's a complex example because also no one is is defending basically the the, the market reforms and and actually now the, the they don't only have the left wing coalition that generally wins elections, but they have a, a more left wing coalition that generally wins that that but but it has quite diversity because when when people think about the far left in Latin America, they think the Castro sympathizers. Actually, one of the of the candidates for for the primaries of the broad front in Chile, like they are called the, the very more far left, is there has called Phil Castro dictator. So so I guess they are not orthodox at least. So maybe there is hope in, in some way that that, that, that 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 they could embrace some some quite libertarian ideas. Because it, for example, in, in in Iceland, the Pirate Party, which in theory was to yeah. the left. Of, Social democratic. Yeah, I think that this this I think goes back to like the difference between libertarian and liberal. Is I, I think there's I think libertarian ideas in their more radical form have are, are have much less staying power. They like uh, there's a good essay by my friend Dalibor who uh, who uh, uh, but the rise and fall of Slovak libertarianism. And he, he, that's the, I don't know much about, much about Central European libertarianism. Yeah, I don't know a ton about it either, but you just Google the rise and fall of Slovak libertarianism, and it's about how post the, you know, post the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, uh, there's just in general a kind of a searching by young people for, you know, what's the alternative. And uh, the West, America, sent a ton of, a ton of, pamphlets and literature and and you know people to give lectures sort of like how IHS and Cato? groups Cato yeah Tom Palmer um, from Cato you know goes all around setting up think tanks you know spreading libertarian philosophy th throughout the former Soviet Union and the Slovaks ended up adopting like really radical Rothbardian prescriptions <laughs> you know they they there were there was talk about a hundred percent reserve banking and stuff like that, um, and so there was this like moment, a libertarian moment in in Slovakia, and uh, it kind of came and went. And now you uh, apparently uh, there's a lot of like baby boomers that think about when they're in their youth how they used to be Rothbardians, and now they're like more sensible li liberals. <laughs> uh, this is funny. I mean, I mean so I, I, I guess I know, the moral of the story is that, like, the harder core your libertarianism, the more fleeting it will be when it has its time in the, in the spotlight. And the more sort of encompassing your ideology, the more accommodating and adaptable your liberalism, uh, the more the longer it will last. Of the former, I mean, communist countries, I think Slovenia is the one that is better, I guess. Is what better? It's doing better in economic terms. I have no it's idea. <laughs> I, I used to. I mean, there, there is, there are some Serbians in, in Peru and, and in other parts of Latin America. Actually, <laughs> for for strange that it, it sounds, apparently there was some some Serbians that tried to kill Evo Morales, which it's what a strange story. I, I don't know why. I mean, what I know is that there are nationalists that, that are basically gangsters and 
probably a right winger in Bolivia hired them, but the, the, the government actually killed them so they couldn't murder it. But, but, but it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's true. I think that, that in, in, for example, in Nordic countries, the libertarians have do some other reforms. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for example, that's, that's a point that Bernie never makes a concession. That, for example, when he talks about Dagmar as being a socialist, the, the prime minister, the, the next day, uh, make a... I saw that. Saying the the the, 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 the thing more was capitalist, they were social, but he wanted Bernie to retract the Bernie never said anything. Yeah, uh, yeah, and all those countries, including Scandinavia and Germany, have like like Christian social democratic parties, right? Where they're where the the, the left and right divide is more like again on the cultural stuff, and it all comes back to culture because. You know, they kind of ignore the welfare state. They're like, the welfare state is just here. And then de the debate is like, do we raise the retirement age? Or the debate is like, do we, uh, you know, do we make unemployment insurance a little less generous? That's the debate. And then most of the difference between the parties is really where they emphasize culture. Uh, anyway, um, how late are we going with this? We are barely, I think we can wrap up this. Okay. Says that'd be good. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, yeah, well, thank you for, uh, for the invite. That's fun. Him.